Revelation 21. Last week we got through the first eight verses. This week we're going to pick up in verse number nine. But you'll remember <clears throat> in the first eight verses, John saw new heaven, new earth. He saw new Jerusalem coming out of heaven, down to earth. He also makes mention that the, verse number three, that the tabernacle of God is with men. Keep that in mind. Okay, we read verse number four, shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. Okay, he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Then, down in verse number eight, talks about those that are disqualified from being in new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. They were the ones that, in the chapter before this, at the great white throne of judgment, had to pay the price for their own sin. Then in verse number 9, John gets a little glimpse and is given permission to tell us a little bit about what this city, New Jerusalem, is going to look like, that place that he's gone to prepare for us. Then in verse number 9 it says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the twelve gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, twelve thousand furlongs. The length and breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof and 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, and the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysop chrysoprasus, and the eleventh adjacent, and the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Now, I'm going to stop there. I doubt we're going to get through all of that, but we're going to try. But, starting in verse number 9, I want you to notice what the angel, one of the angels that had one of those seven vials that we read about, and it seems like years ago now. But that angel takes John, the revelator. He says, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And then, it says he took him up into a high mountain, and he saw the city. The city isn't what John was really supposed to be getting a good look at. He was supposed to be looking at the bride. But in order to understand truly, right, the bride of Christ, you must understand the love that the Son had for the bride of Christ. Right? We know that He loved us with an everlasting love. We know that He is love. We know that no person that has ever drawn breath can ever say that they were unlovable because God loved them in whatever state that they were in. Doesn't mean that God forgave them. They had to repent for that. But everyone was always loved by God entirely, without reservation. How much so? Go read John chapter number 3. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Right? But before you can see the bride, you've got to see the place that the groom prepared for, that the bridegroom went to go prepare. Right? Where else are you going to find the bride of Christ except in the abode that Christ went to go prepare for? 
And John just happens to get a glimpse of the city and he says, wow. Right? I mean, we've quoted it for several weeks in a row now. Right? That it hadn't even entered into the heart of man what he's gone to prepare. Right? You can't even wrap your mind around what the city's going to look like even with these descriptions. Keep in mind, John is limited to words that you and I understand. Okay? He says, you know, one of them foundations... It's sapphire, but I've never seen sapphires like these sapphires. One of them's emeralds, but I've never seen emeralds like that. He says these gates are all made out of a single pearl. He says, I've never seen a pearl that big. Right? The words that he's using, he's saying, I, I can't, I'm only able to tell you what I can convey. He says there's a whole lot more that's bottled up that we don't have words for. Is it any wonder that the second half hadn't been told? It's because we're not able to receive it yet. So what John's scraping the surface here, he's saying the bride's got a beautiful abode in heaven. See, under Jewish customs, if a man wanted to wed a bride, most of the time the fathers would have a prearrangement beforehand. It would be an arranged marriage. But one of the conditions for the bride to be given as the bride was that the bridegroom had to go and prepare a home. And that home had to meet the approval of his father and the bride's father. So when John's taken to this mountain and the angel says, hey, let's go get a glimpse at the, the son's bride. Let's go look at everybody that's going to be in glory. Right? Part of that is, just so you know, John, you can go back and you can tell everybody he did it right. He made an abode that is better more than we could you know ever deserve more than we could ever ask for more than we can even think of right it's a beautiful place and that home right well it was a house at first but that building that was constructed for that bride and bridegroom to dwell in was meant to be a statement of one his preparedness to be a husband but two also the adoration and the effort that he's going to put in to demonstrate the love that he has for the bride and when the fathers sign off on it and they say it's ready to move into what they're saying is this house is ready to become a home this building that you've constructed can now become something more right keep that in mind but he's taken to an exceeding high mountain okay and then he sees the great city he calls it holy jerusalem You've never seen a city that was holy. You've never seen a person that was holy. You've experienced, if you saved, conversation with someone that's holy. That'd be the Holy Ghost. I mean, he just barely pierced that veil on the Mount of Transfiguration for Peter, James, and John to just get a glimpse of who he really was. And they're ready to start building temples right there on top of the mountain. Right? Imagine God in all of His glory, the Son, the Lamb, in perfect holiness, calls for New Jerusalem out of heaven, it comes down, and the whole city is holy. Right? I've seen what the works and the edifices that man's built with their hands, and how beautiful they are, and the intricacies, and stonework, and glass, and precious metals. But I've never seen a holy building. Even if you could conceive the greatest... It's impossible for your mind to produce an image of something holy because your mind isn't saved. It's still part of that sin-cursed flesh. You can't wrap your head around what it is to be holy, let alone a whole city. Right? John gets... And the very first thing that he says about it is, it's the holy city, Jerusalem. Right? This place is unlike anything you've ever seen. Then... He goes on to say, verse number 11, says that it has the glory of God. It's holy, and it's been adorned with the glory of God. It's a part of it. It's baked into it, if you will. Every brick in those golden streets that we just read about. right? Every pillar that's on one of those buildings in the city. Right In the very core of what Christ went to prepare for you, He put His own glory into it. Right now, I will remind you that Moses begged God. He said, Lord, I wish that I could see you. 
God said, you can't see my face. No man can see my face and live. But he said, but I will pass by you, put my hand over you, cover you, and when I remove my hand, I'll let you see my glory. Now Moses in the flesh saw the glory of God. But he never saw a whole city that was baked with the glory of God. The Bible says that that's what Abraham was as a nomad out in the wilderness searching for. God had promised him all this land and he had promised that his descendants would inherit. They'd number as the stars in heaven. But Abraham was just looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. You know what Abraham was looking for? He was looking for a holy city that had God's glory all over it. Now I believe he got to a place where he got a little glimpse of it when he met a fellow named Melchizedek, but that's a whole different story. Okay? But what I do know is that Abraham was looking for a city that had the very nature of God as part of that city. Right? This is a place where everywhere you go, you can see and feel the very presence of God. Right, for us who have been separated by that gulf known as sin, right, we get a little happy around here when he just makes his presence known around here every now and then. Imagine that everywhere you go, it's that multiplied to the extreme, not limited by flesh, not limited by what we have here. He sees this city and he says it's holy and it's got the glory of God all over it. Is it any wonder that the Bible tells that when we get to glory for all eternity we're going to praise and worship him every step you take you just get another dose of his glory everywhere you look it's the glory of God no wonder we're going to celebrate and worship and have the camp meeting of all camp meetings if you will for all of eternity because everything about this city right it's got God himself in each and every part of that city that's how much he was dedicated to. That's how much he thinks of the bride. But it says, verse number 12, or I'm sorry, verse number 11 says, And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now the description there, when it says the light of that city, it's talking about the quality of it. Notice it says it's clear as crystal. Right? There's no black light in heaven. Okay, There's no different kind of LED bulbs where you got warm and you got cool. The light is pristine. It's clear. It's perfect. Right? I believe that part of that means there's not going to be dust in heaven. You ever been watching a movie or something, the projector, you see all the dust in the air? You're not going to have that in glory. The light is clear. Everywhere you go, there's no defect. Right, that would remove your ability to take in the fullness of what God went to prepare for the bride. Okay, but, verse number 12, he says, It had a wall great and high. It had twelve gates. And at the gates, twelve angels. And the names that were written on those twelve gates, it says they're the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Then verse 13, he says there's three gates on each side of the city. Okay, the distribution of those gates show that God had no preferential treatment toward who could enter into that new city. How many gates are on the north of New Jerusalem? Three. Same as on the south and on the east and on the west. Everybody had the same access in order to the same opportunity to enter into that city. But then notice he also says that there's an angel stationed at each and every one of them. Now, I know what one angel can do. You can go read the Old Testament and see how many of them, you know, in the enemies of Israel, one angel could whip in a night. Right? Those angels are a reminder that you're there not because you wanted to walk into the city, but because God gave you a place in that city. Right? I'll remind you that in the Old Testament, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were put out of the Garden of Eden. What did God station at the entrance to the Garden of Eden? He stationed an angel with a flaming sword. Right? Angels, especially cherubims in the Bible, are always a representation of the unapproachability of God. They're the gatekeepers of God. You don't go anywhere that you want to go. You go where God says you can go. And just in case you tried to rear up and 
walk up to the throne of God in heaven today, you couldn't do it on your own will. God would have to will it and allow it. Why? Because there's cherubims stationed before the throne of God to prevent anything from coming to God that God doesn't want coming there. Now, does God need cherubim? No. But it is an outward representation that you didn't earn your way into that city. You were gifted a place in that city. You were given a place. But also those guards would represent that while he went to go prepare it, nothing got into that city that God didn't want in that city. I'll remind you, it's holy. You know what it takes to be holy? You gotta be like him. That's why he commanded us to be ye holy as he is holy. You know what those angels did while Christ was making that city? They didn't do much because I don't know where he made it, but it came out of heaven. But just on the off chance that you had a doubt that, well, is everything in heaven going to be great? Yeah, because God put his secret service at the detail of every gate and nobody got in. Nothing entered into that city that didn't meet God's expectations and God's requirements. It was the best of the best that made it past those angels. It was the things that met God's approval that were allowed to per be permitted into that city. But then, in verse number 14, it says, The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The twelve gates were the twelve tribes of Israel, the patriarchs. Okay, and then the twelve foundations, each have a name of the apostles on them. That's your Old and your New Testament economy. Okay? It's no accident or change that there were 12 of each of them. Okay? But the 12 gates, how did Christ enter in to the world? Through the womb of a woman. Through one of the 12 tribes. It was prophesied many years before Christ ever came all throughout the Old Testament that he would come and dwell among his people. Right, that he would be born of a virgin in a place called Bethlehem, Judah. Okay, but the 12 patriarchs, we all got in to the city. That's why they're the gates. But we all got into the city because God grafted a way for everybody to enter into that city through the true vine. Okay, well, those true vine, where, where does that come? It starts with God's chosen people. Right, well, actually, it started, we've been teaching all the time, started before the foundation of the world when God put together the plan of salvation. But God chose those 12 tribes to be the tribes, the people that he would choose, but then also bless the world by being born of a virgin through one of those tribes. You got in, right, not just because of the preacher that preached salvation to you, not just because of Christ who died on the cross, not just because of the trail of the blood throughout all the generations. You got in because one day God made a deal with a fellow named Abram and changed his name to Abraham later. And it was because of one of them tribes. Right? But then he says the foundations are the twelve apostles. Okay, the thing that makes your entrance into that city so steadfast and sure are the principles that were delivered by the apostles from God. Okay, the tribes of Israel would have died and gone to hell without Christ, just like us. Okay, if there was not a Christ, there would have been no hope for anybody. Right? The foundation of what keeps those gates open, or what you read about all throughout the New Testament, it's what was taught to the disciples, later the apostles, that was passed down to you from generation to generation, that it's by grace through faith not of yourselves. That it was because He became the propitiation for our sin. That all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Right? The oracles that God had laid the foundation of many moons ago, He just gave a mouthpiece to them that we call the apostles. Right? The things that we are taught that there's pleasure in sin for a season, right? that's always been the case. Okay, there was some excitement in it but then the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord 
at the sun. What are you talking about, Brother Jordan? Those principles have been laid for a long time. God knew what he was going to do before he did it. So when we get to that city, did what Paul preached, is that keeping the walls of the city from falling down? No. God just let Paul teach you some of the things that keep that wall from coming down. Just like he did James and John and Peter and all the other apostles. Right? But it's a symbol of the foundation of your salvation. You know what each one of those foundations... We don't have time to get into each one of the precious stones that go into those foundations. But if you look at the material used, and you study those materials out throughout the Bible, each one of them speaks to one of the qualities of Christ and why He's the reason that the gates stay open in that city. Why did the 12 tribes of Israel even come to be? Because God chose to make them. He chose to bless Abraham. They chose to honor His promise even after Israel disobeyed or after Israel would turn their back on God. It was because of the promise that He had made to their father Abraham. It was because of the love that He had for them that He continued to keep those promises. But that foundation truly is because of Christ. Who were the ones that first and went and told the world about Christ? The apostles. Because they were commissioned to do so. But, he said, verse number 15, He that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square. What's that mean? It means it's got 90 degree angles on each side. It's a perfect square. Okay, and the length is as large as the breadth. What's that mean? It's as long as it is wide. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and breadth and the height of it are equal. Keep that in mind. This way, that way, that way. All the same measurement. Then he said he measured the wall thereof 144 cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. Now notice, he doesn't say that the wall is the same height as the city. He says that the city is the same length that way, that way, and that way. And then he says the wall's this high. Okay, so we get a measurement for the height of the city and we get a measurement for the wall of the city. Okay, now I've had people ask me, Jordan, why is there a wall in heaven? Is it to keep enemies out? No. It's a sign that what God built, God's going to protect. Right, that if God purposed it, nothing else can touch it. It's a symbol of the security that God gives to the bride. Okay, now what is there to be protected from? Nothing. We've already seen He made all things new. He got rid of all the things that could be a problem. Right, you don't even need tear ducts anymore. That's why He wiped away the tears from their eyes. But why is there a wall? As a reminder to us that He's still got everything in control. That nothing can tarnish anything in that city because it can't get over the wall that he made. But see, I did some hillbilly calculations on these cities, or on this city, on these measurements. And in truth, we don't know because I don't have that golden reed that the angel used to measure the city. It says it was a cubit, but here's the thing. Cubit's different depending on who's doing the measuring. Because biblically, a cubit is from your elbow to your fingertips. Right? Mine's a little bit longer than some of yours, and some of y'all's might be a little bit longer than mine. Okay, it says in verse number 17, right, that he says, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. Now, how long are angels' arms? Don't know. Okay, how long was that going to ring? I don't know. But they speculate that a cubit could have been anywhere from like 16 to 24 inches depending on if they ever standardized it or who did the standardizing blah 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 I chose a foot and a half because I did the math so y'all can deal with the number that I picked okay but when it says in verse number 16 that he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs okay well furlong okay cubits a furlong 
roughly in today's measurements and if we're using the same furlong that John had I don't know but a furlong 185 meters okay roughly 500 feet give or take okay well it says that's 12,000 furlongs by 12,000 furlongs with the length you do that math it comes out to about uh, 1,900,000 and change miles squared okay so 1.9 million square miles to put that into perspective for you if you took the lower 48 of the United States and cut it in half this is still going to be a little bit bigger than that and that's just this way and that way now you got to multiply it high well what are you talking about brother Jordan he said he measured the city and he said that the length the width and the height of it were all the same now what are you talking about brother Jordan are you talking about that it's like set on a hill and that it's got elevation to it no I believe that the city's that tall y'all may look at me like I'm crazy y'all ever heard of skyscrapers he said everybody's going to get a mansion there's only so much room in the city at some point Jesus said we're stacking mansions on top of mansions that's what I believe why does it matter it says that the whole city is made out of pure gold clear as glass regardless of where you are guess what you can see everything but he says the city's that high and he's not talking about the wall either because he gives us a measurement for the wall okay well how high is this city well if you do the math okay the just the height of the city okay is roughly as tall as where Boeing 747s fly so imagine a city that's length and width as big as half of the continental United States and it's as tall as airplanes fly you say where's everybody going to fit in heaven there there's a whole lot of room right we get a picture of who they are it's a number that cannot be numbered and John gives some pretty big numbers you say there's no way that many people can God can do whatever he wants he walked into a building that was locked with all the windows shuttered up just boom he's there right God's not defined by time and space and everything else God wants them to fit God's going to find room but what are you saying city's really big even by today's standards very big city okay well it says that the walls are 144 cubits right well if you do that math the walls alone are over almost 1,250 feet tall right? that's a 120 story building for you just to put that into perspective and in the cities as tall as where airplanes fly what you saying no wonder John had to go into a tall mountain to see the whole city he had to be taken to a vantage point where he could take it all in and to give him a little bit of perspective that angel said here I've got a stick I'm going to go measure it for you and he comes back and John says that's a big city and every square inch of it filled with the glory of God it's a holy city nothing you've ever seen before okay then we get into the foundations right all the stones that go into them like I said we don't have time but each one of those stones right they're precious okay they are pure undefiled nowadays right we know about diamonds don't get me started on diamonds it's a whole racket they've got a whole bunch that they're not selling just to jack up the price on them but diamonds one of the things that they use to evaluate their quality is clarity right they call them occlusions what's that that stuff that's not diamond that got trapped in the diamond when God made it they're flaws not, not in this city everything's pure but each one of them represents a different attribute of Christ and as that attribute or using those attributes you get a better idea of the, the bridegroom but then verse number 21 says the 12 gates were 12 pearls every several gate 
was a one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold as it were transparent glass now not only is the whole city made out of gold clear as glass here streets made of gold clear glass now people get caught up on the fact that we're going to be walking on gold that's not the point the point is is that God used something that you could see through why so that wherever you are in that city you can look down and you can see all them foundations everywhere you go every step that you take you're reminded of who Christ is and why you're there because he is who he is everywhere you look what can you see you can see straight through everything because it's clear as glass nothing's going to obstruct the light there's no shadows that everything about this city is to give you undeniable irrefutable proof of the fact that the one who made it wasn't like us we'll be like him on this day but when he made it we weren't worthy of it but yet all of it what's he make? he's saying search it out I've got nothing to hide everything you can see right through it the light it's pure right there's no smoke and mirrors here everything that he did was what a labor of love and he did it to completion he's got nothing to hide there's no panel that you can knock out a piece of drywall and find all the little tiny bits of wood that he didn't need right there's no janky electrician wires hanging behind all of the nice facade on the outside okay there's no foundation cracks that need to be reworked he's saying I have nothing to hide to show you what I've gone to prepare for you he says I did it the way that God the father expected me to do it which was to perfection and everywhere you go everything you see keep in mind laced with God's glory all over it everything is perfect not because he chose to make it perfect but that's why it ended up perfect because he chose to do so it was the will of God but it's perfect as a demonstration and a representation of how he loved you completely perfectly the way that he saved you completely no redos you didn't lose it somewhere along the line you didn't have to go back and get a second dip in a baptism pool right once the blood was applied it was complete you were sealed it's a representation of his relationship that he desired to have with you here and there nothing hidden completely transparent I am in him and he is in me right or as the song of Solomon said I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine right totally sold out and devoted to one another the city is a reminder of not only how we got there through the gates and the foundations why we're there because of who he is but it's a representation of what God desires for all of eternity he just wants us he just wants the bride he made all things new why for the bride he made this holy city why for the bride we haven't even got a glimpse of her yet but just looking at the place that he went to prepare you know the bride's special the bride is the apple of the son's eye he not only laid down his life he also made a new heaven new earth and a holy city called new jerusalem that's filled with his glory so that she'd have a place specifically for her for all of eternity you do realize that that's why originally a groom would go and make a place for the he was giving it to her Right? the man's responsibility was what to provide to protect to make a way for the family to flourish but the woman's responsibility was what the home that was hers right it's not a home without the bride but as a sign of devotion and how much he did love her he'd go and prepare a place that was to be hers well how much does God love you he made that for you still working on it right now when's it going to be finished when the last one gets in but he said I go to prepare a place for you 
You know why the son hadn't come back yet? Because the father hadn't said it's finished yet. There's still more that needs to be added to it. But when it's finished, John got to look at it. You know what he said? It's a holy city. It's a wonderful place that he went to prepare for the bride. But then in verse number 22, he said, And I saw no temple therein. Go back. Verse number 3. Said, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Again, tabernacle we talked about last week, temporary place. Right? It was meant to be mobile. Okay, not to drive in stakes and make it a permanent place. It was meant to move. He says, The tabernacle of God is with men, but then he says, There's no temple in the city. You know what the temple was? It was a place reserved among God's people so that God could dwell there. It was a place that was built to God's specifications. It was a place that had to meet God's standards or else He would not move in. Right? The temple was a place that was meant to be holy in an unholy place. But here, the whole city's holy. God doesn't need a temple. Right? This city is worthy of God Himself is what the verse is saying by saying that there's no temple. God doesn't need a place to separate Himself from unholiness because not only is the city holy, we've already read it, we've been transformed into the image of Christ, we are holy. There's nothing that God has to separate Himself from. But the tabernacle, what was that? Remember? The temporary thing? Christ can fellowship with us. He's not reserved to one place where He's unapproachable. No, He travels with us. Everywhere He goes, we go. Everywhere we go, He goes. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying there's no temple where God reserves Himself from us. He makes a place for Himself among His people. He says there's no temple in that city. There's no divider. Go study out the temple. The temple is more than just a building. There was also the outer courts, the inner courts. There were restriction levels on who could get close to and enter into the temple. And in the Holy of Holies, only one person, the high priest, was allowed to go there once a year. That was to apply the blood of that lamb to the mercy seat. God says, we don't need a temple anymore. Payment's already been accepted. There's no more sacrifices. There's no more Holy of Holies. There's just God among God's people. There's no outer wall. There's no wall of the Gentiles where if you weren't a part of the select few that you can't get close to the things of God. He says, no, I'm smack dab in the middle among you. He says, everywhere you go, I'm right there with you. But he says, there's no temple. Then, he says, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. You want to know one of the benefits of marrying into a family? You get to hang out with the other family members. Right? Some of them you don't want to hang out with. Totally get that. Right? If you want to know who to steer clear of in the foster family tree, I will be happy to tell you. Okay? A lot of them sit on that pew right there. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, couldn't, I looked up, I saw you had to say it. At least I didn't call you Brittany Boo Boo. But... Right, everybody's got the oddballs in the family right? that you steer clear of. But here it says, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. You want to know, for all of eternity, there's still going to be the Trinity like there has been since the beginning? If the Trinity existed before the foundation of the world, you don't think they're going to exist for all of eternity? The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, both capitalized, says are among the people you don't just get access to the lamb you get access to the father too you know what the son used to build that city for you what the father owned where do you think the son got the materials where do you think those things were stored up and laid away I kind of imagine that it may have been a little bit like David and Solomon when it came to Solomon's temple the father laid up all of the things that were needed to make that city. 
And when it was time for the city to be built, the son took the materials provided by the father and went and in a labor of love constructed a holy city full of his glory just for you. But because the son made such a glorious city, a place that is holy, God the Father himself, just like he did with Adam and Eve in the garden, will walk among God's people, walk among the bride. Right? It's not just the Son. It's the Father. It's the Holy Ghost. We get all of it. You know what Adam and Eve got in the garden? All of God. They had access and fellowship to all of God. You know what we'll have in eternity? Access to all of God. But right? There's no delineation between whether you use a part of one of the 12 tribes or whether you use a part of that Gentile group that got grafted in. doesn't matter. You get access to both. We know that the church is the bride of Christ. We know that Israel was the bride of Jehovah. Here, there's no difference. We're all a part of the family. We all get to enjoy that holy city. We all get to partake equally in the glory of God. But then... He says that the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The temple was a symbolic representation of God's presence among His people. But the temple also was supposed to be the best. Go look at the materials that David laid up and that Solomon used to build Solomon's temple, which, according to all accounts, the greatest edifice ever built by human hands the effort and the meticulous craftsmanship that went into it. That was the best building in all of Israel. Why do you think that when it was overthrown that they went and pillaged and looted the temple of God? Because it had all the best stuff. It had shields made out of pure gold so that the guards standing outward Right, reflected as a symbolic rep representation that the light of God was shining upon God's people from the temple. Right, the temple was a representation of the best that you had to offer. As glorious as this city is going to be, as holy as it is, you know what the best thing in heaven is going to be? The, all, God, the Lord God Almighty, the Lamb, the Holy Ghost. John, just in a little blurb here where he says they are the temple of the city, he says the best thing to see, the only thing worth seeing, right, is the temple. Where are they at? They're among God's people. They're the Lamb. They're the Father. They're the Holy Ghost. They're the ones that built the city. As glorious as this city is, it's still just a city. Why do you think everything that would be in the way of you seeing Him is made clear. He made it so pure that regardless of where you're at, you can still see Him. The light, as He said, was pure, clear. Right? Doesn't matter where you're at, you still get the same view that everybody else gets. You could be in your mansion, you could be over there by the, the sea, right? You could be at the throne, you could be under wherever you want to be. Guess what you're going to be able to see? God. And you've got the same view that everybody else does. Why? Because he's the temple of that city. He's the reason that it, that city exists. He's the reason that the people are in the city. No wonder it says that he's the temple of the city. But the temple was also where you went to, we're not going to have a need for sacrifices, but the temple is where you went to worship. The temple is where you went to go give unreservedly back from the best that you had to the one that was the best thing in your life. You took the best and you laid it down before God at the temple. Regardless of where you are, you know what you're going to be able to see? The temple. You know what you've got access to? The temple. You know what you're going to be able to do regardless of where you are in new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem? You're going to be able to stop and worship wherever you are. Right, we already talked about all the walls and all the dividers. Those have been removed. There's no barrier anymore. You feel like getting a case of the can't help it's in heaven, you're going to have a case of the can't help it's in heaven. 
You don't need to go to a particular place at a particular time and have somebody mediate between you and God. Now, wherever you are, you can just have the best case of worship you've ever had. And you won't be limited by this fleshly body anymore. You'll be able to give back what you've truly desired to show forth to God. He is the temple. You want to go worship? Guess where you got to go? You got to go to Him. You want to go sing songs of praise? Guess where you got to go? Him. And he says, you don't have to sing to a building. Right? He always heard from heaven when those things were done at the temple here on earth. But there he says, you don't have to worry about whether or not I delight in the praise of my people. Or that your worship and that your honor and your reverence right, glorifies who I am. And he says, you'll be able to see it all. Once sin is removed, all the things that separated us are removed. And we truly get to see with our eyes the things that by faith we have taken and believed from the Word of God, and then we'll be able to experience it. Right? Every now and then, because God does inhabit the praise of His people, where else would He live for all of eternity except the city where all the people are going to be praising Him? Anyway, does He not say His ways change not? Is it any wonder that He's going to live among His people when they praise Him? But, Every now and then, we get to praise Him. We get to worship Him. God winks at our ignorance and our inabilities limited by this flesh. And He steps out and makes Himself known around here. And He gets to just put a little exclamation point on the fact that I do enjoy and your efforts around here do glorify and it is a seal of approval of the fact that we've done everything in decent and in order according to the way that God intends it. That we have, as Brother Clint played earlier, listened to what the Holy Ghost wants us to do and then been obedient to do it the way that the Holy Ghost said to do it. But can you imagine, as much as we enjoy that, can you imagine what it's going to be like when you can actually hear God say, well done, at the end of a song in glory? We haven't gotten to the songs that we're going to sing yet. We haven't gotten to the shouts and the praises and the hallelujahs and everything else yet. But can you just imagine? Right? Think of it this way. Some of y'all get all worked up when your sports team does something and you're watching it on TV. Right? And then if you ever go to a game, you get more worked up and more excited because you're there seeing it all happen in person. Right? We sing about the one that we've seen by faith now. Can you imagine how great and how much enjoyment there's going to be in singing about the one that we're seeing face to face? Can you imagine how much excitement, how much delight we're going to take when God's presence is ever pervasive all the time? And when God says, hey, you know that song you used to sing? I kind of like that one. Sing that for me. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to sing that one? At the very request of God? Can you imagine... Right When God stands up and calls your name out on the day that you're going to sit on the throne with Him, right? it's going to happen. It's already been written. It's been told. Will be. But say again, we can't comprehend those things that He's gone to prepare for us. We can barely understand what it's like for God to show up at a church service, let alone what it's going to be like to dwell in the very presence of God in a city adorned with His glory that's holy because He wanted you to have a place where you got the unreserved God experience. Everything about this city was built so that it didn't limit or hinder you from experiencing what God wants you to experience for all of glory. Because He knew that He was going to be the temple of the city. And he knew that you would delight in taking part in everything that he has planned for you. And regardless of where you are in the city, he didn't want you to miss a thing. So you can see everything from everywhere. Regardless, up, down, left, right, doesn't matter. And I've told you, the city came down out of heaven. If it came down, it can be moved. Wherever God wants you, that's where you're going to be for all of eternity. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.